Hi guys, before I get into this article, I feel like I have to explain something. Mostly, what place the scene rewilding is. To give a very detailed description, imagine a land thousands of years ago, teeming with Colombian mammoths, camelopes, bison, American horses, wild birds, birds of prey, and step bison, with predators like wolves, pumas, and saber-toothed cats on the prowl. That is an example of a Pleistocene ecosystem, more notably Pleistocene North America. Basically, in many parts of the world, including North America, it was more like the African savanna. Heck, we even had lions and hyenas throughout North America and Europe, and we even had an American cheetah back in the day. However, during those thousands of years, climate change and human hunting caused most of these magnificent animals to go extinct. And as a result, the biodiversity that once flourished there, and the way the food chain properly worked, disappeared. Yeah, if you think about it, we pretty much live in ghost ecosystems. Trees that can grow back after being twisted or taken down are like that so that way they can survive attacks from elephants and mammoths. The reasons why animals like pronghorns are so fast is because they needed to be able to outrun the American cheetah. Those are just some examples. But with many of these animals gone, these adaptations are just only reminders of a time long forgotten. Now, imagine a land where animals, alive today, roam as freely as the Ice Age animals did, playing the same parts that those Pleistocene beasts once had. Instead of mammoths, camelopes, native horses, steppe bison, and saber-toothed cats, we have Asian elephants, Bactrian camels, Brzezelski's horses, and Gower, with wolves, pumas, and Siberian tigers filling in the role of the extinct Pleistocene megafauna. This is the very definition of Pleistocene rewilding. Finding animals closely related or sharing a similar role in their environment that extinct animals had and releasing them into the new environment to play the same role. Now, this has split many people down the line. Some people say we should just stick with conserving the animals that are already still there, while others say introducing animals like this could become invasive species or act as competition for and kill farm animals. Of course, when it comes to Pleistocene rewilding, the new animals will always or at least usually, start off in a fenced enclosure or as a heavily monitored test group to study the animal's impact on the environment around them. Heck, Pleistocene rewilding is going on right now. A group of Tasmanian devils are being set to be tested on the Australian mainland where they once lived. Some zoos in Europe want to have a test herd of elephants to see their impact on native flora and fauna, and there's one huge place up north where it's truly the main goal. That I will explain later. However, this has sparked many people to fear the idea of a recreated Ice Age ecosystem, and this article is posted by an opponent to it. Today, I feel like going over it and reading it, and try to better explain parts of the them, correct them, or basically try to give off information if the author obviously didn't do their research. Let's begin. Recently, a concept known as Pleistocene rewilding has arisen within the conservation community. This idea is a cause of great controversy as it suggests we should introduce descendants of extinct Pleistocene megafauna to ecosystems where their ancestors once roamed. I just explained this, so you know the idea. This would mean releasing species such as lions, tigers, and elephants into the Great Plains of North America or bringing a species of rhino into Europe. Depends on the kind of animal they need. Yes, lions did in fact used to live in North America. Look it up, they're called American lions. As well, tigers and saber-toothed cats did share a very similar role in their respective lands. Heck, with the extinction coming so close to finally being a thing, where else do you think they'll be putting these animals? But, in my opinion, I think Europe may be a little too cold for most rhino species. While restoring species to an ecosystem in which they, or at least their ancestors, evolved may seem like a good idea at first, we must take a closer look at the implications of such an action. And that's why when it comes to Pleistocene rewilding, it's different from just chucking unwanted pets into the wild. There's a lot of study that must happen. Their impact on local flora, fauna, and what kind of effects they can have on the environment entirely. 
if they prove too detrimental or not beneficial, then they are not needed. But if they benefit an ecosystem like controlling invasive species, helping with seed dispersal, or controlling overabundant herbivore populations, then they can be considered for release into nature reserves or continuing with experimentation. Also, normal rewilding is included in Pleistocene rewilding. So places in North America where muskox went extinct, muskox will always be brought back. These species have been absent from these habitats for thousands of years, most since the end of the last ice age. These systems have continued to evolve without these species. In many places, new species have arisen to fill the ecological void left by the extinction of these ancient species. Pods, I'm sorry, but there are certain niches in ecosystem that just can't be filled after such a recent extinction. We don't have animals that spread seeds or tear down unneeded trees just like elephants do roaming North America. And of course, birds may disperse seeds, but a lot of seeds do not interest birds. Certain Native American trees, like the fruit of the Osage orange or the seed pod of the Kentucky coffee tree, are good examples. These seed pods and fruits were meant to entice things like giant ground sloths, mastodons, and mammoths. The pods and fruit would entice these animals to eat them, and the animals were so big they didn't even need to chew the pods or even the fruit. And so the seeds were remain pretty much unharmed. And as a result, these three animals were their main distributors of their seeds. Nowadays, their seeds would just meet one of three fates. They just fall to the ground and grow right there, being too big or impossible for birds to eat and thus have to share the same soil with their parental tree, will be eaten by some kind of rodent like a squirrel which also eats the seeds, or are found by animals like moose, bison, or something else, and both the fruit slash pod and the seeds would just be chewed up into an unusable pulp for the plant. And even though I am Christian, I am speaking evolutionary terms here. No, there are just some niches that can't be filled in just thousands of years. Sure, there are examples of niches which have not been filled. For instance, no predator other than man has found a way to hunt the American pronghorn since the extinction of the American cheetah. But this does not mean we should intervene. But if it can help an ecosystem and make species stronger if we intervene, then why shouldn't we experiment with it? We caused the extinction of several species and we should try to repair or at least make up for the damage through both traditional means of conservation and trying out new methods of nature conservation. More often than not, introductions of species do not end well. I of course must cite the example of introduced species such as pythons and kudzu. I already explained the difference between the two. Invasive species are animals that were just thrown into a new environment either by accident or on purpose, while Pleistocene rewilding has extensive test groups and research going on. One of the main supporters, I forget their name, stated, if something like elephants were to become a problem, we can easily exterminate them. As well, things like pythons and kudzu were able to take off easily because there was nothing like these animals that existed in North America. So there is no true predators for pythons and there is no true animal that can eat the kudzu. Heck, maybe there was an animal that would be able to eat them that's now extinct. Some wildlife areas in Hawaii, for example, employ tortoises to eat non-native weeds and plants to keep them from consuming the native flora. These tortoises, by default, now act as a proxy for extinct giant flightless ducks and geese that used to live on the Hawaiian Islands. Sure, tortoises are far from flightless ducks, however, they share the same roles in the ecosystem. Animals like elephants, lions, cheetah-like cats, and horses can still fill a role in the ecosystem a lot more easily since there are roles that they can play. As well, much like the giant flightless ducks of Hawaii, some niches that belong to animals like giant armadillos and ground sloths could easily be substituted with other animals, like rhinos and giraffes. Some argue that it was the actions of ancient humans rather than natural selection which pushed these species into extinction. Whether this is true or not, it does not justify the introduction of their modern descendants into ecosystems which have adapted to the lack of these Pleistocene megafauna. As I said before, many flora species aren't getting their seeds spread like they should be getting, due to a lack of large mega herbivores. 
and animals like elk, deer, pronghorn, and at one point bison were able to expand so greatly and still expanding in numbers so high they've become a nuisance to farmers, then they are missing important predators. Heck, invasive animals like feral hogs will be kept immeasurably in check with the reintroduction of big cats like tigers and lions and the reintroduction of wolves and bears. Currently, we have greater conservation issues at hand such as deforestation, poaching of rhinos, declining grassland birds, and deterioration of reefs to worry about something frivolous like Pleistocene rewilding. Okay, first off, if you haven't done your research and I forgot where I heard it from, Studies have shown when a forest is cleared, another one grows several times more trees, basically meaning the planet keeps up with it. Also, if you don't like that statement, then this guy is probably talking about both forestry and deforestation. Because forestry only takes down the sick and dead ones and replaces them with new trees, this is kind of like how elephants would clear away some trees and new plants would grow under the devastation. Also, there's another sort of Pleistocene rewilding thing going on called the Australian Rhino Project, which has the goal of bringing 80 wild rhinos out of Africa and into wildlife parks in Australia to keep them safe from poaching, to have an insurance population if the rhinos do go extinct in Africa, and to see if they can help in controlling bushfires by replacing extinct megafauna native to Australia. But I do agree in trying to conserve species and environments that are going down the toilet. But I still think we should experiment with the idea of Pleistocene rewilding if the benefits can really pay off. But enough with my opinion. What do you think of Pleistocene rewilding? Do you think it should be experimented with? Do you think it should die off like the mammoths did? Let me know in the comments below. And if you really want an idea of what Pleistocene rewilding is, I'll leave a link to a video, website, and Facebook page in the description to a place all about Pleistocene Park. A family with a nature reserve literally trying to recreate the Ice Age Mammoth Steppe ecosystem, and so far has proven successful. Until then, one fish mobbers, I'll see you later.